Mr. Jengapa, Mr. Dixit, dear friends, it really is a privilege to have been asked to address you as part of this uh, conclave. I know I'm a bit of a stand-in for some people who didn't show up, but I'll try and uh, do my best anyway. And I also noticed that uh, there was a slight change, if I'm not mistaken, in the title of the uh, theme. One, I thought it was India and Pakistan, can they become friends? But that was changed by Mr. Chengapa to can they ever become friends? <laughs> Showing how, <laughs> how challenging the task is before us and that if we do do it, then it will truly represent uh, a, a, an achievement of uh, historic proportions. I would like to, if you would give me the uh, liberty to, uh, to change the, the title of uh, the observations I'm going to make to uh, one step further. I'd like to sort of suggest that instead of can we become friends or ever become friends, to must we or can we remain foes? Can we afford to remain adversaries, foes, enemies? Take your pick. Because unfortunately and tragically, it's this negative term which has determined the quality of our political relations or describes our political relations over the past 50 years, ever since we became independent countries. The adversary description is more accurate. And today, we have become nuclear weapons neighbors uh, and have yet to develop possibly the uh, technologically or scientifically informed political cultures that will allow us to live as nuclear weapons neighbors in some safety. So if we pose the question, can we afford to remain foes, then the nature of the question becomes uh, an imperative instead of one of curiosity. Because quite obviously, given the risks involved, minute though they may be, but given the possibility, the consequences of anything going wrong over the next several years, the obvious answer is contained in the question itself. We simply can't afford to remain foes. No way can we if we owe anything to the coming generations. And since we can't afford to remain foes, adversaries, enemies beyond a certain extent, rivalry, yes, differences, yes, but you know, the kind of uh, uh, intense adversity that has uh, described that relationship, uh, we've got to do something about that. And since we can't do that, then we simply have to find a way to become friends. And becoming friends, since it's a survival imperative, the answer has to be yes. We must become friends. And therefore, we will become friends because the will to survive must prevail over every other instinct. Of course, the case for, uh, for Pakistan's uh, friendship with India and India's friendship with Pakistan rests on a much broader basis. It's not just a survival imperative, but the survival imperative hopefully shall get us going in a manner that hasn't been the case before. Wars were tragic but affordable in the past. Today, they are no longer affordable, given our ability to inflict the scale of damage on each other should the worst scenario come to pass. Come to pass you know, and even though it may appear to be very minute, nonetheless it's unacceptably existent or extant. Even so, there is a huge degree of skepticism and indeed cynicism that uh, informs the relationship. We find it expressed in statements that are issued on both sides of the border every day that the case for friendship, the case for survival is obvious. Nonetheless, will it inform policies? Will we develop that momentum? Will we sort of you know, begin to uh, move ahead? I believe that a, you know, a major paradigm shift has taken place in recent months. There are so many dates one can refer to. You can refer to September the 11th, you can refer to October the 1st, you can refer to December the 13th, you can refer to January 6th and 7th when the two leaders met in uh, uh, Kathmandu, uh, or 
And I believe in many ways, and being the Pakistani High Commissioner, maybe I'm somewhat partial, but I think the truly um, uh, seminal development has been January the 12th, when the President of Pakistan addressed the nation of Pakistan and came up with a comprehensive program against extremism of any kind, yeah, against extremism of any kind, be it religious, ethnic, uh, political, of any kind that was, would be unacceptable within Pakistan or from any territory that is within the jurisdiction of Pakistan under the guise of any cause. Now this is a seminal development. We have had problems which have been cumulative and which the President, if I may uh, take the liberty of reminding our audience, had been addressing even before the, uh, September the 12th. He had taken action against certain organizations. He had made pronouncements about what he saw as the, uh, or what his vision was with respect to Pakistan immediately after assuming power. In his first address to the uh, nation on October the 19th, 1999, he spelt out his vision. And then, of course, he articulated his domestic agenda. And he made it quite clear that extremism had no place in the politics and, and the policies of Pakistan. Nonetheless, movements take place with respect to actual situations somewhat more slowly. And the events that I referred to have accelerated the pace of decision making in Pakistan and they will provide a new context for India-Pakistan relations and we do hope that India will be, will see it in its own interests and in the interests of the region which it, uh, in which it is placed to reciprocate the kind of gestures that Pakistan has already made and these are not just uh, comprehensive policy announcements. Actions have already taken place even before and much more so since. Now, I, I do believe we are in a very different situation. The whole history of India-Pakistan relations has been one of failed dialogues. We have never managed to sustain a dialogue process for any length of time. I think the largest number, we had eight rounds of, uh, uh, of discussions in the, um, in the early 90s. I think Dixit Saab might have been the foreign secretary at that time. So you've got the record for having sort of sustained India-Pakistan dialogue for the longest length of time. And yet it ended up in a cul-de-sac. And once it ends up in a cul-de-sac, which ends in uh, mutual recrimination, and then the blame game begins, the situation deteriorates, and that um, in, um, you know, informs this, uh, the quality of the relationship very negatively. We have an opportunity now. We have had the historic policy pronouncement by the President of Pakistan on January the 12th, which comp and within which he addressed the Prime Minister of India with reference to the January 1 uh, uh, letter to the Indian nation by the Prime Minister of India himself uh, in which he quoted uh, and reaffirmed the statement that he had made a year earlier of the kind of relationship he'd like to sort of uh, um, uh, have with Pakistan and the willingness of India to, uh, to tread on uh, chartered territories or untrodden paths and to build up a new architecture of peace within which the concerns of both countries uh, would be taken on board by each other. We have the opportunity now of entering into a self-sustained negotiating process in which we will be able to address the expressed concerns of each other in order to bring about a climate conducive to the negotiations being sustained and leading to a movement along a broad front of cooperation between the two countries. All of this will require us to be sensitive to each other's primary concerns. I believe a huge step has been taken by Pakistan to address what you have time and again been saying has been your primary concern. We differ on the definition of your definition of it or on the uh, causes of problems. But what we have taken on board is that for a negotiating process to sustain itself, if one side says an issue is of central importance to it and the other side shares its commitment to an improved relationship, then the very fact that one side names an issue and believes it to be of central importance, the other side must concede it for the negotiating uh, process to go ahead. This applies to both. 
Pakistan says that Jammu and Kashmir is a, an issue of central importance. We, we can marshal a whole um, array of arguments, and I believe it's essentially uh, a valid argument. And many Indians with whom uh, we interact privately agree with us and say, yes, it is um, uh, an issue of uh, central importance, yet it is an issue on which we differ and have huge differences. But that it is an issue which has impacted upon the relationship more than all the other issues combined is something which I think when we are not constrained by the formality of um, enunciating official policy, uh, it's not too difficult for us to agree and say that we need to concentrate on that. We are also sensitive to the fact that we'll enter into negotiations, us preserving our point of view, you preserving your point of view, but within a context of a shared commitment to bring about a better relationship because of the priority to our larger program for our respective countries, our domestic agenda, the need for a conducive external environment, the need therefore to address problems, the need therefore to have a negotiating process which has, um, uh, Mr. Gore once again said, what, it should be open-ended to the extent that we can draw energies and old patterns can break up and we can reorganize our relationship at a higher level of complexity. All of these things are required and I think there is a huge opportunity before us and we shouldn't waste it in, in polemical debate at which we are probably second to none in the world and each one and our diplomats receive huge compliments uh, but when it comes to results in terms of India-Pakistan relations we've been marking time and once again we are brilliant at blaming each other for that but we always end up admiring each other's uh, you know um, argumentative abilities and all but in terms of delivery, bottom line performance, we have been weak. We have an opportunity now to move ahead in a manner acceptable to public opinion on both sides. We need to educate public opinion too. Otherwise, the political processes, the existing states of public opinion might constrain our movements. So we need to move, help each other, move in a, in a broader, with a broader perspective. And I believe we are in a new era, there's a new generation, a new century, a new paradigm. Uh, old issues will remain. All positions will not be changed, but yet we can move towards the narrowing of these things. This can strike you as practical or idealistic. Both views, if you look at the past, good talk, you've heard this kind of talk, nothing ever happens, nice speech, bottom line zero. Or you can say, no, this is an articulation of present possibilities. We can and we cannot afford to miss out on them because of our capacity to harm each other. We also cannot afford to miss out on them because of the colossal benefits that await both of us if we are able to go forward. India collects how much? Less than three billion in FDI and we are not even a fraction. You should be collecting or receiving 20 billion. If China, including, you know, institutional and direct investment and other loans can take in about uh, up to 50 billion a year, there's no reason why the subcontinent shouldn't be taking in a comparable figure, maybe initially much less. Pakistan getting several billion, hopefully going up to 10, you going up to 30 or 40, we benefiting from the colossal strides you've, you've um, uh, made in information technology and there's so many uh, links that we, uh, uh, which are mutually reinforcing. We need a context. We need public opinion. We need to see, yes, both of us are gaining by this. One, one side is not running ahead at the expense of the other. And then we'll be in business, and then the good things will begin to happen. Slowly, difficulties will remain, setbacks will be there, but we'll have a context, we'll have a process which is sustainable. Thanks a lot. Mm. Let me begin by thanking Mr. Arun Puri and uh, management of India today for doing me the honor of inviting me to speak in, the, in this conclave and on the subject which has been given. Uh, <clears throat> Rajchanga Pass modification of the title of the theme reflected the trenchant critical realism of a journalist. High Commissioner Ashraf Zahagir Kazi's changing the title reflects uh, his focus on a more practical question. 
So the contrast is provided. And uh, I, would, I would rather abide by the original title with the adjective ever added to it. Uh, can India and Pakistan ever be friends? Nothing in this world can be uh, incontrovertibly deterministic. So one hopes for the best and High Commissioner Ghazi's presentation reminded me of the great poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz, Faiz's insistence about a certain dimension of life when he said, Seher chahe ho na ho, khwabe seher dekhunga main. Even if there is no dawn on the horizon, I shall insistently dream about a dawn. But then the point is, the dream remains a dream if it is not worked at with the realization that good things don't happen in a vacuum. I do not have to go into a descriptive or analytically detailed presentation on why Indo-Pakistan relations are in their present state since their inception as independent countries. Uh, I would begin by saying that there is, there is the old North Indian proverb that uh, one can choose friends, but one cannot choose one's neighbors and relatives. So the question posed by High Commissioner Kazi is very relevant. Can we afford to remain close? The answer is no. You cannot afford to remain foes, but that realization should be underpinned by a motivation that if we cannot remain foes, what precisely should we do to move towards a certain symbiosis, a certain positive approach to friendship. Uh, and here I am not going into specifics, I am not going into even the marginal references which High Commissioner Kazi made to Kashmir and so on. Let me make two points. He said that in private conversations Indians accept that Kashmir is central. Let me go on public record. I consider it central too and not a private conversation. I am speaking in an open forum. It is central. It is central to the existence of India in terms of the ideological terms of reference on which Indian civil society uh, stands organized. Uh, it is central to you from your point of view. It is equally central to me as an Indian from my point of view. And this is where when there is such a contradiction uh, one should abide by the sage advice given by Henry Kissinger. He says, resolution of difficult issues is not possible in decisive sudden strokes. It has to be a gradual accumulation of slow successes. And if we can while accepting the centrality, whatever the formulation, because I find that much of Indo-Pakistan diplomacy is lost in drafting and semantics. Uh, because, not because, the diplomats, diplomats are that way, because the political leadership is keen that there should be no articulation which would question their survival or uh, will prevent them from facing uh, public criticism. Uh, so Kashmir is central, I have no problems. The second point to which I'd like to respond is when he said that India accuses Pakistan of sponsoring violence and you do not agree, Pakistan does not agree, there's a difference of opinion, I would very respectfully submit that there can be a difference of opinion about perceptions about interpretations. There cannot be any difference of opinion about facts. I leave it at that.
But to go on to what really is needed if we are to progress towards a practical and positive relationship. Since there is a shortage of time, I shall not be uh, detailed in my presentation. I'll just make the points which come to my mind. Uh, while we should move away from the past, the prospects of friendship cannot ignore historical factors or the existing political realities. The effort should be to examine the relevance of the historical past to our current interests. And when I talk of interests, I'm not talking of interests of the power structures. I'm talking of the well-being of the peoples of India and Pakistan. And the political realities is as perceived by both countries. And I am with you when you say, High Commissioner Kazi, that the speech of President Musharraf on 12th was a momentous speech. It defined the new orientation. Uh, I hope that orientation gets translated onto the ground, especially in relation to Pakistan itself. But that is not the point I wish to make. We have to take these two factors. It would be pertinent for governments and influencers of public opinion in India and Pakistan to examine whether the adversarial relationship between us has been a consequence of vested interests and attitudes of the power structures of the two countries, or whether they are rooted in the perceptions and attitudes of civil societies. I don't think, having served in Pakistan for nearly three years, dealt with it for nearly 13 to 14 years in my career, that the average Pakistani or an average Indian wants an adversarial relationship. Of course, public opinion in both countries have historical memories and certain perceptions. But the repeated pattern where when you are reaching a certain, certain threshold of positive progress, things going wrong leads me to the conclusion that this examination is very necessary whether power structures are involved in this negative drift in which we are, or is it civil societies? I think it is the power structures, and that has to change. Uh, future friendship between India and Pakistan is only possible if both India and Pakistan squarely face the problems which affect their relationship, and I have said it about Kashmir earlier, so I don't want to go further into that. But the Kashmir itself is not uh, the be-all and end-all, and I'm not saying you should shift focus from it. But the very attitude on Kashmir has deeper motivations, deeper strategic and other perceptions. Uh, I'll be embarrassing my colleague, Ambassador Shekhar Das Gupta, who is going to speak on China. He has written a very nice book recently, in which he mentions one of the concerns which, le which led to Pakistani, I'm not talking of the strategy, strategic interest of the great past. The Pakistan's worry was that the headwaters of the entire river system in Punjab is controlled by a potentially inimical country like India. Legitimate concern, but in this water, water treaty proves that it can be overcome. Even during four wars, that treaty did not stand abrogated and uh, there was no difficulties for Pakistan. Uh, you see, the other issues which one should acknowledge and overcome are mindsets rooted in the partition, the crisis of collective identity, and here, forgive me if I am being totally, totally frank. My perception is that despite 50 years of existing as an independent country, Pakistan still has a threat perception about its identity. Uh, its identity as an Islamic Republic. And, and this sense of crisis then sort of gets expressed in various ways. And here I think India has a special responsibility to 
I won't say assure, that is, that is the wrong word. It's who is in there to assure Pakistan of anything. But certainly in our actions, in our behavior, uh, let me put it this way. We must stop being preachy about our secularism to Pakistan. We must, we must let Pakistan find its own sense of self without being subjected to critical value judgments off and on, which is a result of political controversies rather than an intellectual process. Uh, then, I think there should be a substantive discussion and a continuous discussion on mutual threat perceptions, whether they are rational or factual, or are they a result of complexes and suspicions. It is an abstract thing to say, but uh, it is worthwhile. You, we always talk about eight items, this issue, that issue. But at the, basis, base, at the base of all of it is the suspicion and constant, constant worry, the questioning of motivations. Example is this morning's newspaper reports, I hope it is not factually correct, uh, that the government of Pakistan has refused transit facilities to Indian wheat going as relief to Afghanistan because Indian wheat apparently is not up to the mark, it is afflicted by germs and so on. Uh, not, quite, not quite a logical thing, if it is correct, because I had the privilege of exporting Indian wheat to, Punj to Pakistan in 1991 when there was a short-term shortage. The wheat is more or less the same. In fact, it is perhaps more qualitatively better, better of a better quality. Now, following or in continuation of this, I must, I must say that, in my view, the debates on the two-nation theory should be abandoned. India should not question Islam, Pakistan's Islamic identity. Pakistan, while adhering to its Islamic identity, must acknowledge that it is as plural of a civil society as India is. And also, there should not be the frequent tendency to question the credibility of Indian democracy, Indian secularism, and so on, which has been part of the public discourse, not just in terms of intergovernmental inter negotiations, but part of the intellectual and sociological discourse in the decision-making elite uh, on both sides. Our, our sort of sitting in judgment about your adherence to Islam and your sitting in judgment about our secularism, it's an irrelevant debate. We are what we are, you are what we are, what you are. And time to leave it alone. Then the past conflicts between India and Pakistan should be understood with objectivity and should not remain a basis for current policy orientations. And uh, and here I specifically refer to stances like, uh, there may be disagreement in India about it, stances like the whole territorial expanse of the old princely state of Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of the Republic of India. Uh, time has passed, things have happened. The concept of Jammu and Kashmir being part of Akhand Bharat uh, is, is, to me, not a very practical proposition. One might stay it for certain limited short-term political purposes, but it is also short-sighted. Equally, Kashmir's future political status or redefinition of its future political status is the unfinished part of the partition. Though I have welcomed most of the elements of uh, President Musharraf's speech on the 12th of January, Kashmir runs in the blood of the Pakistanis. It is neither a historical or a biologically valid statement. Uh, we, are discussing, we are discussing a territory about which we have claims, we have differences. But the question I ask is, should 1.3 billion people of the subcontinent be held hostage when there are a whole range of potentialities to cooperate and be of use to each other? Uh, to this territorial dispute based on inherited historical memories 
and complexes. Uh, there has to be a conscious acknowledgement, a conscious working at the objective that the well-being of the people of the subcontinent of both countries. Inhibitions and reticences about preventing people-to-people -people contact should be removed. To meet is to know, to know is to understand. Understanding removes suspicion and removal of suspicion could lead on to normal relations. These are, I am, I am, I am conscious that these are very normative requirements which I, have, which I have and general requirements which I have tried to articulate. The task is complex and difficult. I accept that friendship is not just possible but it is necessary for the well-being of the millions of people living in this subcontinent. But then I have two conclusions which I want to present. In the short term, I do not see any friendship happening. The efforts should continue. I, am, I, am, I accept the idea of a dialogue, a sustainable dialogue, if you wish. But to talk about friendship in the short term uh, is not a practical aspiration. Secondly, I think Indo-Pakistan, Pakistani relations will move towards friendship inevitably as a gradual process. It will be sufficient unto me at least if you have a certain long period of rational, practical, peaceful coexistence. Friendship can come later. I'm not being pessimistic, but you cannot wish away the realities which we face and these realities are something which are in some respects, a profound threat to India's national security and territorial integrity. Having said this, uh, I don't want to be pessimistic because I am, since my late teenage, uh, I studied political philosophy at a particular point of time, and one guidance or aphorism which has stuck in my mind is a sentence in the introduction to his essay on poetics by Aristotle, when he said, it is not a sign of wisdom to be desperate about things. Thank you.